Hi, and welcome everybody to another Animus Conversation with me, Robert Stevenson. Uh, today, I'm joined with Julia Vaughan Smith as we explore how uh, trauma is sort of uh, making its emergence into the coaching space and explore how that might show up and what we might do with that as coaches. But before I get going, let me allow Julia to introduce herself. Oh, hi. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us this evening. Thank you, Robert, for setting this up. It's great. Um, I'm a psychotherapist and executive coach and been working in the trauma field for about the last 10 years. And um, my book, Coaching and Trauma, was out last year. So I've been teaching and writing about trauma in the coaching field for, for some years. And I'm, I'm pleased to be here. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. So I just want to give a little bit of background to us sort of agreeing to have this conversation um you know right now we're in this sort of pandemic and um i've got my usual coaching practice still running and i was just becoming more and more aware that that what's happening right now is showing up in the coaching space and as i sort of read the the news and watched the news and listened to the news it made me think about how you know, how are people being affected by this what's it triggering for people and how those things might be showing up in the coaching space and where we as coaches may or may not be uh, equipped to deal with that. So I thought, who better to talk to uh, about this than, than Julian, just to get a, a sense of your thoughts and sort of uh, thinking around, around what's going on right now and how might that emerge into the, the coaching space. But before we sort of dive into the, the mix of that I guess something that might be really useful for people is for you Julia just to, to share your thoughts about the I guess the divide or the um, the 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 spaces where we might use coaching or we might use therapy it's such a a tricky question because um, there's such a broad field of, of coaching and such a broad field of therapy but I think um, uh, one of the things I think to, to answer the question for ourselves we have to have an understanding about trauma and if we don't really understand trauma then we're not in a position to be able to answer that question for ourselves very easily which is why I've been talking a lot in the, in the last recent years about trauma-informed coaching. So I'm not mm. aiming to in, get coaches to be quasi-therapists, but to be trauma-informed in their work so they're better able to be very sensitive to the boundaries and what's going on and to be more self-reflective and understanding about their part since we're all traumatised. So um, it's within that, that area. So to ha hone it down a bit, I know that's a bit airy very. Um, if we assume on, the, on that most of us carry a trauma, we are trauma being a lasting impact on the neurophysiology. So it's our earliest reptilian system mm. that senses danger. So it's about safety and danger. And if that was triggered early in their life, then it is very susceptible to being triggered throughout our life to a greater or lesser extent. Um, and um, so if we understand that, then we also have to understand that we, we develop a whole range of defensive strategies so that we can create an illusion of safety mm. around ourselves because the fear of being unsafe is so great. So those survival strategies, things like being very controlling, very avoidant, addictions, work addictions, all those sort of things, whole range of survival strategies. And in coaching, what we meet is often those survival strategies. Yeah, yeah. We meet them in ourselves when we're rushing to rescue clients. We meet them in clients when the work isn't progressing and we can't really work out why, or we, we end up coaching, colluding with this survival strategy. So in, if we're trauma informed, we're able to check in on ourselves about how, am I getting entangled here with this defense strategy of the client? And if we can do that, we can prevent ourselves becoming entangled and therefore making it not worse, but actually not helping, not being a good coach. Um, there are also clients who are showing signs of trauma stress, traumatic stress, hypervigilant, hyperaroused, sweat, re-traumatized. As coaches, we can, if that presents in the room, we need to be able to 
know how to sit with that and help people get their breathing back if we can help them do that and it's not our job in my view to then dig into what's going on with that trauma stress but it is our job to be able to be with it in the session that it's present at and mm. to help our clients think through what would be helpful for them in terms of managing this long term so this isn't something that just flares up something they'll be familiar with and then there are other clients who may for the first time because we've created a safe space for them feel safe enough to talk about earliest experience for example sexual abuse as children that they've never told anybody about before and as coaches we need to be able to sit with that and hear that not close them down not not rescue them but also not then to step in and do work with that early trauma that's not the role of coaches so that's how i mm. see broadly different yeah. categories um but of course you know it is where we need supervision yeah absolutely. And, and be clear about our boundaries if we're not clear about our boundaries as coaching what coaching is what we're there for what our competence is we get tempted to lessen those boundaries because of our own survival strategies and we're not using supervision then we haven't got a learning space it was one of the the key questions um that, that people were sharing um when i posted this in our community group around you know coaches having supervision that allow them to reflect on what might be showing up in the space to then be able to identify is there something going on here that sits outside of my competency that I need support in dealing with or I need to work with a client to find out how they might uh, seek other support to to deal with this and it's mm -hmm. I guess there is a concern um, that, that sometimes coaches are practicing and rescuing and not having supervision and, and therefore not noticing that the challenges that they're facing. Mm. I think that is a risk. I think if, 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 if coaches aren't aware of how, of how some of their own trauma is impacting on them about how they're, you know, we don't have to do a historical dig because I'm not saying we have to know everything that's happened to us because often it's unconscious anyway, but have to see how, what our defensive strategies are when we feel vulnerable and unsafe, where do we go to? Mm. And one of the common ones is helping professions is we go to rescuer. Yeah. We either go to rescuer or we go to controller. Yeah. Or and sometimes we go to, oh, nothing to me, me, I'm going to distance myself from that. But rescuing is a predominant one. Yeah. And, and as soon as you step into the rescuer, you are entangled. So your trauma system is entangled with the client's trauma system. And, and no coaching can happen. One of the things I often notice when I'm doing supervision is that somebody is entangled. They're in the story with, yeah. with the client. They haven't stepped back and gone, what's, what's yeah. going on here? What's at play here? They're mm -hmm. in it and they're wrestling with it, colluding with it. Um, and that can be you know, very challenging for a coach, especially when they don't recognize that that's what's at play. Yes. And I think it's something, again, you know, when pe people have racked up a lot of coaching hours, coaching experience, that tends to happen, it can still happen. Mm. Um, but I think when coaches are quite new in the profession, new in their skills, then I think the anxiety is great anyway. Am I getting this right? Am I doing this right? You know, am I good enough? And all those sort of things play in, you know, especially if there's a, a childhood history of being told you're not good enough or feeling you're not good enough, then that plays in. So, you know, we are the there and then, is constantly playing out in the here and now yeah yeah in us as coaches so first place to start is always with ourselves and I, I think you know one of the things that we explore a lot at animus is that self-reflection to yeah. you know, explore what's going on for you what's coming up for you as the coach as you as you you practice mm -hmm. with your with your clients or your colleagues to have a sense of where are you being triggered I think mm -hmm. That's a really key thing for me um, is, you know, what's what clients issues or challenges trigger me and mm. then what I might need to go and look at in order Absolutely. to go, what's that about that's coming up for me? Because I think if we're able to do that and we're able to stay in, in our resourced, self-regulated mm. state. So if we're able self-regulated, so, you know, our stress hormone responses are sort of pretty ticking along. We're not 
agitated, we're not um, uh, stimulated in any way by anxiety, mm. then we're able to be fully present with the client. Yeah. So whatever they bring, we can stay present and we can stay coaching. But as soon as we tip out of being self-regulated, our capacity to be present goes, our capacity to be in good co connection with our body goes. Mm. And then we can well get dabbling into areas of trauma, which actually are not within our areas of competence. Yeah, and there was something you said there about um, you know regulating ourselves and therefore knowing what a regulated self yeah. uh, feels like and that kind of just checking in there. When I'm okay in the world, how do I feel? What's that like? So that when I'm not okay, I can begin to notice this. That's right. And your body is the, is the, the instrument. Yeah, and I think a lot of new coaches are caught in the am i getting this right or i want to get this right yeah. and that can throw us out of that regulated self so it can then be difficult to to notice if we're we're regulated or not because we're so anxious around the other things that are at play well let's be honest if those of us who've trained in anything i've trained in lots of things you know unconscious competence or in conscious incompetence is yeah. the worst bit of learning <laughs> The most disturbing bit of learning that you're conscious that you actually haven't got all the skill set that you yeah. need. It's a yeah. very uncomfortable place to be and stimulates all sorts of early memory mm. uh, of criticism and, and getting it wrong and all those sort of things. Mm. It sort of makes me think about how, I guess this is slightly off topic, but I'll, I'll kind of drag us back on in a moment, but it, made me think, it makes me think about how do we... I guess, create a safe environment for ourselves as practitioners to feel okay and then in order for us to practice. Mm. Mm. Well, I suspect everyone listening would have, you know, lots of thoughts about that as well. So I think it is, some of it is environment. So, you know, how can we create a safe environment mm. for our clients? And the thing about working with, with, if there's trauma around, is boundaries are really important. So the environment also means our relational environment with the client and any other systems around the client. Yeah. So there is something about being mindful about that, I think. And I think it is about having practices, if you like, body reflective practices, which we can um, use before we're with clients and um, in between clients so that we're able to keep that self-regulated place. Um, and um, just, I think we can track ourselves. We would mm. all know if you reflected on your client work, you would know the times you felt unsafe. And you're able to then think about, well, what was going on? Some of it might've been about the client, but some of it might've been about the setting, might've yeah. been about the timing. It might've been often about the contracting. If the contracting hasn't been set up properly or it's a bit weak, you yeah. know, it, it's those sort of things that are really important in creating a safe space. Yeah, and that, that sort of makes me think about, you know, how important it is to spend time contracting mm. so that we, we both know, both parties are really aware of what it is that we're here to do Absolutely. and how are we going to do this and what are the, the boundaries around this Absolutely. work. And the, and the clearer we can be with that, I think the easier it is to then notice when we're slipping outside of that. Mm. I think it's essential for clients to feel safe. Mm. And um, often, as, as you and others who've been supervising, often when, you know, coaches might bring things to you, say, well, what was the contract? You know, what, how did you contract? And you realise that because there was some anxiety built in at the beginning, the contracting had been sort of skipped over or somehow other people had influenced it and it didn't feel quite right or something it's a very important boundary to the work and it also enables that the client to be a, a willing signer up to up, upper to what you how you're proposing to work for them you know yeah. is this work is that okay what you know um otherwise we can be ambushing them and i think there's something really interesting you said there about you know that we're okay with our contracts and often people will go and uh, shelf pick contracts and go oh, i'll use this contract mm. 
without going, what, what does this contract mean for me? Yeah. And what do I want this to say? And, and, you know, sometimes we talk about when creating our contracts, looking at what are our red flags. And so yes. how do we bring those as part of, of that setting up? And I think especially right now, um, mm. during a, a, a space of lots of rah, going on, I think there's a really important to be really clear about what are we here to do and how are we going to do this? Mm. Absolutely. I think that's right. And I think, you know, at, at this point in at this time that we're all living through, you know, people often need a bit more time than they might at other times mm. to actually be with themselves in this safe space we're created because, um, the whole most of us our lives have been disrupted to a greater or less extent some people to a great extent others yeah to some extent it's still been disruptive but it, it has a um an impact on all of us so there is a bit more space about just oh god can i just be with myself for a moment um in this space um and for us to be able to hold that and um help them hold their vulnerability yeah in this time and that, that's that, that the word vulnerability really kind of triggered me into the original thinking around this as you know uh, COVID-19 how is that showing up in the the coaching spaces and how might we manage stuff that starts to, to rise to the surface that perhaps as coaches we're not used to seeing kind of bubbling through mm. I think the first thing to, is to to just check in with ourselves about is this an do we carry anxiety about being overwhelmed hmm. and that could be that part of us is already feeling overwhelmed you know that uh, so it, part of us you know think of us in parts so not all of us is but maybe part of us is so if there's a concern how will i cope what will i do you know that could well be sitting about a fear of being overwhelmed and so something about you know what parts of me does that connect to what's if anything can I do to reassure that part or to um, help it see things a bit differently because of course we get into all sorts of thinking habits as well um, and those can be examined and changed in all sorts of ways as we know um, so I think that's one aspect so I think that um, it really comes back to preparing for ourselves you know if we can if we can be present and we can stay within our coaching boundaries, then if all we do, and I say all we do lightly, is to sit, listen attentively, be witnessing, be acknowledging, have connection with a client, good job, mm. job done in some ways, you know, in yeah. this case. If we can't do that, then, we, we're grasping for all sorts of other tools and techniques that we think might help us at this time. Mm. And that's, um, so that would be my initial answer to your question. Yeah, and that, that's something that's really interesting because, you know, I often hear new coaches talking about you know, what tool, what technique, what thing should I do, how should I do it? And sometimes I sort of say, you know, just, just pull back and be there. Don't think that you need to fix it with a, a mechanism allow it to emerge and then you know reflect upon it and explore where the, where does the client want to take this and what do they mm. want to do with this but that being part of our overwhelm is is really interesting especially now when we might be overwhelmed by other things and not actually noticing how that's showing up for us mm. Mm. no that's right i think you know i we with this sort of this being able to be present this being with ourselves self-regulated but if we have an anxiety but you know we have to look in ourselves and it's quite likely that parts of us feel overwhelmed mm. at times all the time some of the time you know it would and and or, or maybe for some not at all but um i think it's there i think i think it is true that i think some of the coaching space might feel more intensive yeah and i think those of course are all working online and you know that that's not a great you know some people are very skilled at it they've used it a lot for other people they don't use it so much so we're also learning how to use this um virtual space mm. well how to connect with people across this virtual space in in a, in a way that is is congruent to how we want to work so i think there's also issues about how we set that up for ourselves what helps us as coaches do that 
um, because it is more tiring. Yeah, there was, as you were saying that, I sort of went, ah, I'd never thought about when you make the, the switch, as some of us would have done from face-to-face -to, -face to, to virtual coaching, to actually have a conversation about, so how are we noticing this being different? Mm. And what does that mean for us? And so mm. how do we, uh, as collaborators, uh, explore this mm. and it's suddenly maybe go oh okay there's something just to, to kind of to, to think about and explore similarly to you know if we change our practice space with with a client midway through our a, a season of sessions we might explore with them how mm. is this sitting for them yeah and of course people's responses will be different mm. you know some people might welcome the slighter distance yeah and yeah. other people will feel a slighter distance more acutely so we can't assume how everyone responds but i think what we do know is that we are creating a different space of connection yeah and so it's how do we make that how can we maintain the connectivity through this new vehicle or new for some of us mm. um not not for all i know mm. yeah and a lot we can learn from people who, who've used it a lot and have got a lot of experience about how to make this a really the best um space of meeting that we can i guess there's something just, just sort of popped into my head that i know if i was a face-to-face -face, uh with a client who was uh having a stress reaction that i feel very competent in my skill of exploring that of of creating a sense of regulation mm. of of getting in touch with the, the breathing and the, and the here and now with mm. them but I've never had that experience um, in the virtual space. So I'm sort of going, oh, I'm not quite sure how I would explore that. I'm imagining it would be very much the same, but I'm just curious around your thoughts on that. Well, I think it would be the same. I mean, it, it would be the same and not the same. <laughs> yes. So your responses would feel the same. If you're connected with your client, you would be picking up the same visual clues. You, you, you know, you might be less able to see quite what's happening to their breathing in the mm. quite the same way, but you'd have a sense that there's something dysregulated going on and you would pull them, you'd seek to pull them into contact with you in yeah. the way you would one-to-one. -one. Um, but of course, also it depends in what environment clients are sitting talking to us from yeah, and how safe that feels as well. So I think there is something about being able to explore are they you know if people are working from home and they've got everybody around them are they in a space where actually they can feel safe mm. if, yeah absolutely um, if you're... And, and how can that be made to work um and to recognize that that does vary depending on people's living arrangements of course um, if, you, if you're in the space and there are people in that space that are part of your challenge yeah, it's going to be very challenging to talk yeah. about them because they may overhear and yeah. all of that. Whereas, which is yeah, which is really interesting about how we manage our spaces and support our clients to manage their spaces during this and the boundaries. You know, I think I've heard lots of people talk at the beginning of all of this. I think it's settled down a bit. People have learned, but people are on on Zoom the whole time, and people were knocking on the door the whole time, as it were, through Zoom. And people were overwhelmed because mm. they hadn't set up proper boundaries to this. And obviously, if people want to have a please people driver, yeah, then you know, being available to people all the time is the same as if you're, you're in an office. It just you've learned how to do it differently. So I think there are those things to be mindful of. And I think it's perfectly possible to have a very good connected coaching conversation online. Mm. Of course, it is. But I think if people are dysregulated, you do the same things. You're trying to go them in contact with you, talk about breathing. You can still take them through breathing exercises in just the same way. Um, and then, you know, say, and, and who, who else is around you that can help you with this, mm. for example? Um, and, and take it just the way you would a coaching conversation. But if we're out of connection with ourselves, we're not able to do that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that just kind of really emphasizes that necessity to know oneself and to understand oneself and to be aware of what's going on and to to take the time before our coaching to, to, to settle into mm. where 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 we need to be in order to show up as our best with our clients. Yeah. Mm. And so I start to think about um, how 
or what we might notice in the coaching space now um, with, with the challenges that are at play, what, what, and I know we're kind of going to sort of guess and make some assumptions here about what might we start to notice kind of coming into the space or the, the tensions or the anxieties that as coaches, we should just be looking out for as perhaps being indicators of something more uh, at play. Well, I'm tempted to ask you, what have you noticed? <laughs> <laughs> what have you noticed? Yeah, so um, so one of the things I, I think I've noticed is for some of my clients, there's this real sense of uh, weight. There's a heaviness about, so, you know, when will this be over and what will that mean? And will, will I be okay uh, after this? And I guess also a weight of... Um, you know, if they're the breadwinner in the family, what does that mean? Um, uh, or, you know, will, will their job be there when they come back? Mm. Um, and, and also the anxiety, one of the other anxieties that I've, I've noticed that sort of cropped up in the coaching that I do is that whole social distancing and how disconnecting from people around them has created this sense of lostness. Mm. Mm. Yes, I, I, yeah, I get. I think that. Well, I recognise all, all of that as you say, and I think that is what's happening. I mean, obviously, you know, there's a major disruption to people's lives, and for some people, that is is has affected their whole job identity mm. and their whole work identity. For others, not so much. It sh- depends, but everything has been thrown up in the air, and so the habits that we had established around work have mostly all been completely thrown up in the air. So the habits that just held us in place, how we go to work, how we do our work, how we do that, how we relate to the family, how we earn the money, how we pay the mortgage, all those things for many just been thrown up in the air. So we're we're now being required to establish quite quickly new habits. Mm. And a lot of, and over time, those new habits, some of them will settle in but other ones will start to rub. Yeah. And it's that rub, which I actually don't like this new habit. You know, some new habits, oh, this is actually quite a nice new habit. Yeah, I I might keep that. But for others, I don't really like this new habit. I don't like being separated from my friends. I don't like that disconnect. It doesn't feel good for me. Um, And then we're all subjected to our thought habits about how we interpret what's happening. So the narratives we tell ourselves. Mm. Um, And you know, I say, I say this as if I don't do this, but if we worry about the future, we can't solve the future. We can only be in the present. We can't solve the future problems now. We can just say, well, how can we prepare? What could I do today? Yeah. It would take me somewhere, which might help me be, take me where I want to go in the future. So we can, you know, we can do that. Um, so I think there is something that we can also just be mindful just be watching out for how people sort habits, which of course connect to their past experience of not Mm. being wanted, not being loved, not being protected. And all these things can get very stimulated for some people in this lockdown, depending on the situations they're facing, depending on whether they're alone, whether they're in a family that actually isn't a, a good family to be part of. These things can also bring earlier traumas to the fore yeah. So some people are re-traumatized by that. And of course, I don't know if anybody has anybody come up in coaching. It's because it's affecting older people. We probably haven't yet. But, you know, those people who have been in ICU, very small proportion of the population, but those ha- have lasting psychological mm. impact from that experience. Um, so they do have traumatic stress. Yeah, not experience. So, you know, they might they might come into the field, but it's a very small minority. For most people, it's either stimulation of worry and anxiety that's projected onto the uncertainty, and that's carried carried with life narrative. Often, you know, it's not safe. I won't be. You know, I'll be destitute. I won't earn any money. That's a life narrative. There's not often evidence for it. Yeah. Um, or They are people, again, a minority who are um, re-traumatised because the isolation, it it reminds them so much of earlier isolation that they are having uh, a a traumatising response in their neurophysiology. 
Yeah, wow. So they, I mean, it's really interesting. So there could be a lot going on that's underneath that surface that's coming into the coaching space. Um, and as, as coaches, it's to just pay attention to, to what that might be mm. and to notice that without getting our pickaxe out and go mining Absolutely. for it. Um, uh, and it. And I know that we can get over curious as coaches and kind of scrabble away to, to, to unearth what's, what's there and in a way that can, I guess, be uh, leading or even crossing our boundaries with, with our clients. And I guess that mindfulness to stay present mm. with what's presenting itself, mm. to stay curious, of course, because without curiosity, there are no questions, mm. but to, to stay curious and but present to what's taking place in the, in the now. Yes, I think that's really, I think that's really important. And I think there probably is quite a lot going on. Um, and sometimes just the space that we can give for clients, confidential space, allows them to get in a, a better regulated space. And if, if they can get better regulated, they can do better thinking. Mm. You know, our thought habits become quite, um, become negative when we're out of regulation, when we're anxious, we start, you know, going off onto the thought habits, which aren't helpful because they make us suffer more. So we can also help people to, to if they're in a more regulated state, yeah. they can see that for them. We can, they're able to see that for themselves. Um, if they're not in a regulated state, it doesn't help us telling them about their thought habits. Very much. <laughs> Yeah, so you know that, but I guess that's part of classic coaching to enable the yes. client to reflect upon what's happening and to, yeah. to enable them to be in the space with you to mm. notice what's taking mm. place and mm. to to bring them back into that. When our mm. clients step away and be and get caught up in something up here or down here, to kind of go, okay, so wh where are you? And exploring how that space is helping or hindering your ability to explore what you want to explore because i think i think the context has changed around us but actually the coaching process should be exactly the same mm. it's there's no reason for us to adopt any different coaching process than we've used before yeah context might change a bit of course and some clients might be presenting that more intensely than others but the coaching practice and coaching process remains the same but of course we might be more triggered we are carrying our own parts who mm -hmm. are worried our own parts who are anxious our own parts that um, feel overwhelmed or whatever um, so it's it is more possible for us to be t carrying those with us in the coaching so I think it's again it's an op it's an opportunity for us to to create enough space for us to do the self-reflective practice and just get back in contact with ourselves and check in with ourselves. And I think also with clients, you know, working with this idea of parts is really helpful. So if people say, oh, I feel so overwhelmed. And so, well, okay, so let's, let's think about that part of you that feels overwhelmed. And is there a part of you that doesn't feel so overwhelmed? Mm. Maybe, or they may not be, but it, it gives the opportunity that we're not all one experience. Yeah, yeah. We have other resources available to us. Sometimes they get blown out of the water, I know. But if we provide a sort of safe space, clients can often reaccess those, unless they are re-traumatized, in which case we can listen and sit with them and then ask them what help they would really need. And I think there's something uh, courageous here for coaches to really to step into the space of, if something is happening in the space and you're going, this isn't within my uh, competency to, to actually say to the client, you know, so what help would you need to explore this? Yeah. As opposed to falling into my clients in a struggle here, how do I help them? Absolutely. No, I would agree with you. Absolutely. And agree with you. Absolutely. And I think that's why, you know, from coaching, we can make a contribution mm. to people who are traumatized in that way. So, you know, help them, sort out what would be most helpful for them yeah yeah and, and um not to to say it's not my job but actually just explore uh, what would be helpful here and and um and even you know i'm not sure i'm the right person to help you with this but maybe mm. we could find who might be you know there's always a framing it up yeah yeah 
Yeah, because one of the, the sort of thoughts that I have around this as well is that we will move through this period of time, but this period of time will still be in our systems. Yes. And it will reshow itself. It will emerge again through different triggers in the coaching space. And I guess that I'm saying this as a reminder, I guess, for coaches mm. to kind of go, we might be beyond the time or the struggle but it, it will still sit with people and to mm. be present to that and to mm. recognize that. Yeah, I think that's right. I've sort of been talking about, you know, coaching for recovery. So that's not, not trauma recovery. That's not what I'm talking about, but recovery of our professional and our lives, you know, recovery of the life that we now want. Who am I now? Yeah. Post this pandemic. Who am I? What is it I want for my life now? And, and what will help me recover what I might have lost and to pick up what I might want to gain. So a sense of recovering from this collective and individual and very individualized experience, I think is also quite a helpful concept and, and plays into exactly what you're saying about that actually the ripples will last. Mm. And as we know with recovery, it doesn't happen just like that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I think there's something really sort of, uh, sort of pulling a thread that's pulling at me um, around how we take the time to do this and we are patient with ourselves Mm -hmm. as well as with our clients. You know, we can get into a habit of, you know, I get in there, I mix up with my client and they move on, but there is a sense of, well, how can I be patient with this Mm -hmm. and allow it to take the time that it needs to take? Yeah. I think that's right. I think that's a really nice way of putting it. Really nice sense of being patient. And in that patience can come self-compassion and also then compassion without rescuing for the other. But I I think that's a nice way of putting it. Yeah. And noticing also myself, this kind of not only might my client's uh, identity be uh, challenged because of a loss of of work or or Mm. income of or the, the patterns mm. also my sense of that might be at play as well because I as the coach and am, am now living a very different life than I was you know three months ago mm. and with both of those things at play if one doesn't give it the space and the time mm. then I guess as you were saying earlier we get into that entanglement we get mm. into buying into each other's stories yeah that's right I think one of the survival talked about survival strategies, trauma survival strategies earlier. And one part of our defense system can be that our sense of ourselves becomes identified with a particular job or role. Mm. And it's a sort of survival attachment. If you like, like, you know, we had a survival attachment as a child because we couldn't have a healthy one. Um, so it's a similar thing. We attach to a job or a role as a, as an anxiety survival attachment. And of course, if that's taken away, we're then left a bit bereft from this survival habit that we had built in. And it can give rise to quite a lot of internal disturbance. Um, but I think we can also, if we understand that, say, say with clients, yes, but what else of you is there? You know, yeah. who else is there who, who is ready to take on this step into the new world so we will know that that's not the only identity entity this person has but it's, it's a survival yeah and, and i guess that there's there may be a sense of mourning that self as well sure. mourning and, and having to kind of deal with that yeah and as you mentioned earlier the sense of lostness yeah who am I now? And of course, and who am I now? I don't have all the distractions that I've used for my trauma all these years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that having to face oneself. This lostness. So I think that's quite a, an understandable response to those sort of things. Um, but it's not, it, but there's also a potential for growth in that. Hmm. Hmm. I, I mean, you know, we, we were saying just before we started this conversation um, how. You know, people have found their in, on, in entrepreneurial self yeah. during this time as well. It's amazing. I mean, I live you know quite rurally, and um, I've been am- amazed how you know small shops and traders have really taken on a hugely entrepreneurial spirit to support the community, to feed the community, protect their staff. It's staggering. 
mm. absolutely awe-inspiring and and sort of you know fills my heart as it were about the generosity of people to yeah. have put that energy in it didn't come easy but a lot of energy in to actually create this and i think well how extraordinary too the impact that has on people who've done that yeah and people who've volunteered for various things who've taken on those roles who've made big you know community or family um commitments and and just the you you meet other parts of yourself which can be very reinforcing and, and you might think actually i want to take more of that part of myself into my recovered self yeah i think that's a really lovely thought to to sort of begin to bring this to a close that, that idea of so what are we learning now or what has been sort of made no, made known to us that we can bring with us mm. as we move into the next mm. phase whatever that might be mm. yeah i do i think that's right i think we should also see those new growths those new points of growth those new points of opportunity as well as the distress and you know the other part of it it's not it's not all that and it's not you know it's it, it's spread across yeah and yep. we can work with our clients in the ways that they are with it as long as we stay firmly in our coaching julia as ever it's been a real pleasure having this conversation right. with you and, and i know that we could just for a long time <laughs> forever and ever um could you just uh let those listening and, and watching know where they might be able to, to find you or find your work sure you can find me under on my website is um, juliavaughnsmith.co.uk and also coachingandtrauma.com so you can find i put most of my coaching blogs on on coachingandtrauma.com and um, you'll find my book on an Amazon or Open University Press and all other booksellers, online booksellers are available. Thank so you. you can find, find that there. Yeah. Lovely. And I've been posting uh, more regular blogs in this time, just as, as, as things have come to me. So um, they're up on coachingandtrauma.com because we suspended our masterclasses for the moment, obviously. Mm. I don't feel that they're ones that I really want to do online. Mm. Um, I think it's better to, to wait and see when we can um, come together face to face. But who knows? I might have to shift that ground. We'll see. We'll see. But thank you so much for this opportunity. And thank you, people. I can see you there. Nice to see you all. Thank you for coming in and, and, and joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you, everybody, for joining us either on the, uh, the the live recording or listening in uh, afterwards. It's been a real pleasure having this conversation with you and I look forward to our next conversation. Thank yeah, you so thank much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Robert. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.